thank you for, for coming. I, I hope I will be able to, to, <laughs> to tell you something helpful, to be helpful. Um, uh, I was, so I, I'm a, I teach in the um, creative writing MFA program at the University of Florida. And as you probably know, this is a very common thing in the United States that um, a lot of writers teach. We teach workshops in creative writing. Um, uh, I've, one of my students said it's a welfare system for writers. It's a way for writers to make a living. Um, but I think it's also something that, that there, there actually is a benefit, uh, that, that there are things that writers can teach. My, my colleague, Patrick Powell, oh, his answer to the question, what do you teach, is we teach that which cannot be taught, which is a paradox and I think a true one. Um, and I, I wanted to focus today on, on dialogue uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that it's, it's, it happens to be something I'm a little bit obsessed with at the moment. <laughs> Um, and also because I think it's, it's, it's one of the most element, most essential elements in fiction. Uh, but I'm curious to ask, if, if you're, write, you're all writers, uh, how many of you find it easy to write dialogue? No. Well, just one. <laughs> how many, and the rest of you find it difficult. That's interesting because usually I get half, a half and half. And what I've noticed is that writers I find it pretty easy. It comes pretty naturally to me, but I find that writers who have an easy time with dialogue have a very hard time with description. Writers who have a hard time with description, or have an easy time with description, have a hard time with dialogue. I, I hate describing people's faces. I don't know, ever know what to say about eyes. I am at a loss to think of anything original to say about someone's eyes. They were brown. <laughs> um, and um, so recently I've been reading uh, a lot of writers who, whose novels are and, uh, very much dialogue driven um, that is to say dialogue is the principal mode by which the story is told and that's what I really want to talk about is how you can use dialogue to move a story forward how in some ways it may be all that you need is dialogue. Uh, there are writers, some of whom I'll be talking about, whose books are 80%, 90% dialogue, but they're stories, and the story moves forward entirely through dialogue. Uh, and um, uh, I want to talk about some sort of techniques for that. Um, and then I also want to talk a little bit about how writing dialogue for fiction is different than writing it for a play in the theater. Um, but I thought I would start with a, a quote from a great essay about the writing of dialogue by Elizabeth Bowen. Um, all my examples are, are British today. I have to work two computers here. Um, this is uh, Elizabeth Bowen, a great British novelist, short story writer, wrote an essay about dialogue. And this is what she said what are the realistic qualities to be imitated or faked in dialogue? I think it's very important that she said faked. <laughs> Spontaneity, artless or hit or miss arrival at words used. Ambiguity, speaker not sure himself what he means. Effect of choking as an engine. More to be said than can come through. I think that's the most important line. Irrelevance elusiveness, erraticness, unpredictable course, repercussion. I think this is as good a description of the ingredients of what makes dialogue successful as I've ever encountered. So I have a couple of examples here that I want to share with you of, of what I can sort of, like how do I make this move forward? Um, oh, I see. Okay. So the first one is, these are all British, um, which betrays my, my, my own fondness for British. Yeah, fine. I, I love British fiction. Uh, people, you know, people talk about the great American novel. I don't want to write the great American novel. I want to write the great British novel, <laughs> even though I'm American. 
So this first example is from E.M. Forster's A Room with a View, very famous. This is the opening of A Room with a View. And I think it's an interesting example of how you can open a novel with dialogue. The Signora had no business to do it, said Miss Bartlett, no business at all. She promised us south rooms with a view, close together, instead of which here are north rooms, here are north rooms, looking into a courtyard and a long way apart. Oh, Lucy. And a cockney besides, said Lucy, who had been further saddened by the Signora's unexpected accent. It might be London. She looked at the two rows of English people who were sitting at the table, at the row of white bottles of water and red bottles of wine that ran between the English people, at the portraits of the late queen and the late poet laureate that hung behind the English people, heavily framed, at the notice of the English <coughs> church that was the only other decoration on the wall. Charlotte, don't you feel too that we might be in London? I can hardly believe that all kinds of other things are just outside. I suppose it's, it, it is one's being so tired. This meat has surely been used for soup, Miss Bartlett said, <laughs> laying down her fork. So this was Forster writing, uh, I believe in 1906, I think was the year. So this is an, an old text, um, but his techniques, I think, are very much the same ones that writers use today. If we look at the section of this that isn't dialogue, even there we see a really, Elizabeth Bowen had talked about repetition. Here, he uses repetition so effectively, the repetition of the word English, English people, in order to convey this sense of disappointment because uh, they've arrived in Florence, in Italy, and everything is English. And the owner of the hotel, the signora, is English and speaks with a Cockney accent. <laughs> so that's kind of the, the humor of it. And if you look at the dialogue, this really follows Elizabeth Bowen's advice, um, particularly, I, I want to lay emphasis here on, on repetition. Um, the Signora had no business to do it, no business at all. There we have a repetition. She promised us south rooms with a view, close together, instead of which here are north rooms. Here are, nor here are north rooms, looking into a courtyard and a long way apart. What do you think, what is, what, do you think, that repetition of here are north rooms, here are north rooms, if you were an editor, would you keep it or would you cut it? <laughs> cut it or keep it. I mean, what, 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 does, it, what does it add? Obsessiveness. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I think it does add obsessiveness. I mean, I think the, it would still be good without it, but it gives you a little bit more. And it also... What? It's dis disappointed. Yes. Here are north rooms. Here are north rooms. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's the way people talk when you are uh, dealing with something. Yeah. 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 And you know, I think you wouldn't. I don't think that if 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 Forster had chosen to cut that repetition, we would notice. But I think it does make a positive difference. Um, uh, and likewise, you know, Charlotte, don't you feel too that we might be in London? I can hardly believe that all kinds of other things are just outside. That's a very informal kind of English, and it, but it's how people talk. So I think this is a, a, a very good, it's also very dramatic. I mean, it really takes you right into the story and right into the conversation and principally right into the relationship between these two women. And even though in these, she hasn't yet, or Forster hasn't yet mentioned that they're in Florence, there's a lot of information is being conveyed in not very many words, and I think the dialogue has a lot to do with it. So let me look at, a, let's look at another example. This is a much stranger one. Okay, this is another, a writer I love, Muriel Spark, The Ballad of Peckham Rye. This is a, 1960, I think this was 1963. Get away from here, you dirty swine, she said. There's a dirty swine in every man, he said. I want a word with Dixie, he said. Now, Mavis, be reasonable. Showing your face round here again, she said. Now, Mavis, now, Mavis, he said. She was seen to slam the door in his face and he to press the bell and she to open the door again. 
My daughter, Mavis said, is not in. She slammed the door in his face. All the same, he appeared to consider the encounter so far satisfactory. <laughs> So this is again the opening of the novel. This is how the novel begins. And it's, it's, a, you know, it's a sort of strange beginning because at first, who are these people? Mm -hmm. you know, she said, he said, you don't even have names. Um, you dirty swine. I mean, this is British, very, very British to call someone a dirty swine. Uh, it's not American at all. We would probably say, you pig. Yeah. Uh, but I love that opening bit. It, it tells you so much about these characters. Get away from here, you dirty swine, she said. There's a dirty swine in every man, he said. Mm. And as the novel goes on, you'll see that this character, whose name is, um, is, well, he calls himself either Dougal Douglas or Douglas Dougal, depending on his mood, is a bit of a philosopher. You know, his response tends to be to speak in generalizations. And then we get a little bit more specific. I want a word with Dixie. Sorry? Oh, it's quite similar to the David's party. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm very, she's a big influence on me. I love Miro Spark. So, yeah, you're astute to pick that up. I mean, I was, I, I feel like I've learned a lot from her. So, I want a word with Dixie, he said. Now, Mavis, be reasonable. So, the names come in. And now we know a little bit more. We know that the woman to whom he's speaking is named Mavis, and that she, uh, he wants to talk to Dixie. That's not a lot more information, but it's some. Showing your face round here again, she said, which is so British, <laughs> the rhythm of it. Now Mavis, now Mavis, he said, again that repetition. She was seen to slam the door in his face, and he to press the bell, and she to open the door again. This is a very strange mm -hmm. line. Yes. She was seen. She was seen. It's that passive voice, but it also suggests a sort of observer mm -hmm. who is, this being Neural Spark, is probably God. Yes, <laughs> <she> <laughs> My daughter, Mavis said, is not in. She slammed the door in his face. So now we know that Dixie is Mavis's daughter. We know that uh, this is not the first time that this man has been there looking for Dixie. We know that Mavis is very angry at him. Presumably her anger has something to do with his relationship with Dixie. Uh, and then we get this incredibly surprising line all the same, he appeared to consider the encounter so far satisfactory. And, and what I love about this as an opening of a novel is that it, it's sort of, you're drawn right in. There's no preamble. You're just right there in the scene. And yet there's already an element of, of mystery, of mm -hmm. something that, has a lot has, that hasn't been explained. And so I think what keeps you reading, if you keep reading, is you want to know who are these people? What's going on? You know, why does he consider it satisfactory? That's such a strange thing to say. But then again, he's also said there's a dirty swine in every man. So I think that a couple of things to say about both of these openings and about the effectiveness of dialogue in opening a work is speed. One thing that you get is incredible speed. Um, this is so different from, say, the opening of, of uh, Anna Karenina uh, yes. or um, many other novels that begin very slowly in an almost sort of stately way with the description, generalizations. This is just diving right in. As my, one of my teachers would say, there's no throat clearing. There's no, <coughs> you're just, you're right there. And, um, and again, the dialogue is used to propel the story forward or the novel. Okay, let me do the, the last of these. This is, okay, so this oh, is a no. very strange, you do know Ivy Compton Burnett? Oh, yes. I love I Ivy know. Compton Burnett. Yeah. So Ivy Compton Burnett is a writer I've only recently discovered, and I've been, I've been reading or inhaling her books. And before I read this, just a little uh, context. Um, she was a, a 20th century writer 
Uh, she was, I believe, born at the end of the 19th century. She died in 1969. Most of her novels she wrote in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, this one is from the, I believe, from the 40s. However, there's a, a deliberate, um, almost anachronistic quality. They all take place in a, at the end of the 19th century, but in a very almost placeless sort of British, it's very British, but there's never the name of, she never gives the name of the town. It's usually a country town. Um, it's as if she wants to separate her story from history. There, there's, there's never any reference to politics. All there really is is dialogue. Yeah. People within families. Um, and uh, also nearly all her novels begin with breakfast. <laughs> I think almost all of them. I don't think every single one, but nearly all of them. I mean, she starts with, well, where else do you start? And she always writes about families. So, so this is a little different, this example. Um, so the children are, are not down yet, said Ellen Edgeworth. Her husband gave her a glance and turned his eyes toward the window. So the children are not down yet, she mm -hmm. said on a note of question. Mr. Edgeworth put his finger down his collar and settled his neck. I love that description. <laughs> so you are down first, Duncan, said his wife, as though putting her observation in a more acceptable form. Duncan returned his hand to his collar with a frown. Mm -hmm. This is a really weird opening, and many critics have commented on, on it. Um, because it is dialogue, but there's only one person speaking. The husband says nothing. And the wife says the same thing twice. So again, we have that repetition. So I think it, when I first read it, I was a little thrown. I didn't know quite how, what to make of this. Why is she saying it twice? And then it, as I looked at it more closely, I began to figure out what was going on, which is what are, what are you able to deduce about this marriage? <laughs> just from this little fragment. They're not very communicative. The husband is not communicative <laughs> yeah. at all. Yeah, he doesn't answer her. There is a history before this. Sorry? There is something <coughs> happening before this. Yes. For any reason, he doesn't want to talk or he's looking at the window. This is happening again or what's, what, what happened before? And then she wants to, to start conversation uh, because the question is obvious, so, so the children are not down yet. She knows that the children are not down yet. Uh, I think that maybe it's a mean to to start a conversation with, a, with her husband. Yeah. And when there's nothing I, to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very important. <laughs> and I think also she wants him to do something uh, in terms of the children, to be more active maybe, or to bring them down or something. Well, and in fact, as the novel goes on, the question of the the sort of the fact that the children are not up yet becomes a major Thank source of conflict know. because the yes. children are all sl sleeping too late, mm. according to the father, and the mother is trying to kind of kind of uh, you know take the side of the children a little bit. So it's a very domestic moment, and it's it is there is a sense that it's habitual. This happens every day. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's 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 a little tense. Yeah, well, you maybe know. the children are the only topic they can they can share. <laughs> or so. It's also it, because she's writing about British people in a very old-fashioned British world. Breakfast can't really begin until everyone is there. <laughs> you know, this is one thing that was for me as an American. I had to start getting used to in reading British fiction are the rules. Ah, yes. <laughs> you know, the family gathers for breakfast, and breakfast does not begin until everyone is present. It, it's, it's a funny idea of breakfast, because I think, uh, we, I think here too, breakfast is sort of something, it's not, I mean, am I right? It's not really a, a communal meal for most of us. It's just you sort of, sorry? It depends on the family. I guess it depends on the family. And if you have children, you have to feed the children. But this is a, this, we're in this world of, it's like Downton Abbey, okay? It's, um, <laughs> it's, breakfast is 
going to be a buffet with lots of silver dishes, and there's a butler, and everyone's going to sit at the table, and they're all going to sit very properly. So, uh, what I think is 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 very interesting about Ivy Compton Burnett is that she's she's actually writing from a very different time. She was writing this, I believe. Let me check the year of this book, but I think it was it was either just before or during the Second World War. Um, so she's a, she's kind of almost showing a nostalgia for a lost yeah. England that maybe never existed. Um, mm -hmm. But I just want to check the year of this book. Um, 1935. So this is not 1935. I mean. The funny thing is, she's writing this in 1935, and Forster writing in 1906, I believe, sounds much more modern, mm. much more contemporary. I think that it's very interesting that the title of the book is A House in Its Head, and if the opening is the wife talking to yeah. his, uh, his hus uh, her husband and him not answering, I mean, it's she's the head, and if we're talking about the Second World War, it's like a huge thing to be writing about. Well, she's, her titles are really interesting. Um, all of her titles are kind of the same. She, she likes her rhyme. She likes to use, like she has a house and its head. She also has um, uh, a family and its fortune with the two Fs. And then she has a whole series of novels with titles like Man and Wife, Brothers and Sisters, Parents and Children, uh, Mother and Son. So, so there's a kind of simplicity to her titles that's deceptive because her novels are are very very complex so these are just you know three examples of, of I think what you can of, 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 of interesting ways that different writers use dialogue um, I think it's also worth noting with with Ivy Compton Burnett it's not so clear from this excerpt but but if you read her work She's an exception to the rule because her characters don't really, they, they, they speak in a way that's very formal. It doesn't sound like natural speech. It's, it's, it's much more like Oscar Wilde. Uh, it has a, 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 a slightly <coughs> artificial quality, but it's nonetheless you know, very effective. Um, you, you feel like no one in the real world would have conversations like this, but but there's so much going on in the conversations that, that you sort of allow her to get away with that. Uh, there's no attempt at, at naturalism. Um, and I think that that was, even at the time she was writing, very deliberately anachronistic. And it's probably not something that a lot of writers would do now. I think now most writers really want dialogue to sound like the way people talk. Um, so the question becomes, how do you do that? How do you make your characters sound to a reader like real people? Um, and, you know, I don't know that there are any specific rules for this, but I think that... Um, Elizabeth Bowen really hits on a lot of the most important uh, sort of ingredients. Um, and I think it's interesting that she says imitated or faked in dialogue. The reason I think that's important is that if it's an experiment, you actually were to record a conversation <laughs> and then transcribe it, I will bet you it would not, it would not sound convincing as dialogue. It's, it's a strange thing. Uh, it, it wouldn't, because you have to imagine, you know, the reader, this is all going, we're, when you read, there's like a voice in your head, and that voice in your head hears things differently than if you're actually participating in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's, it, she says, faked. Um, uh, it, it, it's an interesting experiment. You should try, um, you know, doing recording some actual conversation and seeing how it sounds, and and that faking. You know, I think the the way that I do it, if I'm writing dialogue, is I usually just 
put it down on the page and then I read it aloud to myself. And I try to see how it sounds and if it sounds convincing to me. And what I usually discover is that it, it, I'm doing the same thing that I do with any kind of writing. I'm, I'm, I'm actually manipulating the dialogue. I'm, I'm using the dialogue to propel the story forward. Uh, and so it isn't as natural, it, it has to sound naturalistic, but of course it isn't really naturalistic because most conversation doesn't propel the story forward. Most of the conversations we have, we're sort of going in circles. And that, for a reader, can be very boring. Uh, although, you know, there are writers who have experimented, I think, with that idea, with the, the actual sort of <clears throat> tediousness of most conversation. Um, uh, in fact, I think even Ivy Compton Burnett, usually the first hundred pages of her books, not very much happens. People just talk. And then suddenly all sorts of things start to happen. Um, so I also think that this is this idea of, of I love the word, in fact, she uses the word artless or hit or miss arrival of words used. Is that, do you know what that means, hit or miss? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure quite how to translate it for those of you. So it's um, some. It's just a hit or miss. It's like it's like if you're throwing a dart, you may hit and you may miss. So there's a kind of. Especially you have a. Try and error. Yeah, the, and I think that, that that is important because you know when we talk, often we can't find exactly the right word, um, uh, and that I think she emphasizes when she says, "Speaker not sure himself what he means." That's, that's tricky. How do you convey that the speaker doesn't know what he means? Um, <clears throat> effective choking, as in an engine, like you're uh, you know, trying to say something and it's just not coming out. More to be said than can come through. Irrelevance. Irrelevance is, I think, a very important element. It's the, it's the introduction of things that, that don't seem to have anything to do with the story. Um, elusiveness. Uh, you know, referring maybe to other things, to songs, to uh, to um, things that are going on in the in in the world that you're describing, politics. Um, uh, you know, I just did a, in the, something I'm writing. I have one of the characters say to the other during an argument, "You sound just like Trump," <laughs> and that's. A good example of elusiveness. And then erraticness, unpredictable course. I think that, for me, is the most fascinating thing about writing dialogue, is that if I sit down to write a scene in dialogue, I don't usually know what, I usually know where I want to get, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. And as I write it, the dialogue will often go off in completely unexpected directions that I will usually allow myself to follow thinking, you know, the way conversations do. You start talking about one thing, you start together. Sometimes you arrive at a point where you, um, but sometimes you can be taken to places you never expected to go. I mean, I will give you an example from my own work because I'm finishing a novel right now that is very dialogue heavy. So I've even been working on it while I'm here in Buenos Aires. And I, uh, just today, well, let me find the example. I can have it on my computer. Um, I, this, this was something that just came very spontaneously. I don't know if this is going to stay in the book. <laughs> it may not. Um, so the, the, this is a conversation between two, uh, a man and a woman who are in their 50s, who are having, one is, one is married, one is in the middle of a divorce, and they're having an, an affair. Um, and uh, they're taught, and one of them says, asks, you know, uh, their names are Bruce and Sandra. But can you? Uh, well, so Bruce and his wife have not had a sexual relationship for a long time. So Sandra sa says to him, you know, poor baby, all those years without. And he says, can you miss what you what you never had? And. Uh, she says, how, 
How do you feel now that you do have it? Are you asking if I regret the lost years? That's not my nature. I don't see much point in looking backwards. The past is over. What's over is useless. She says, I thought we were supposed to learn from the past, history repeating itself and all that. I didn't have any idea I was going to write this, okay? I thought they were going to be talking about sex. He then says, probability theory suggests that when history does repeat itself, it's either a coincidence or a matter of how we choose to interpret the numbers. Remember all the numerological stuff people were spouting after 9-11. You could do the same thing with any two numbers. Accountants call it cooking the books. Do you know that expression? <coughs> Such an odd expression. I wonder what cooked books would taste like. <laughs> or would it depend on the book? You could write a story about that. I think I will keep this. <laughs> but I, I started this. I didn't anticipate that the conversation was going to go in this direction. I mean, it, I thought that the conversation was going to be entirely about the affair, about you know whether this affair was going to actually lead to Bruce leaving his wife, um, to the fact that you know after a long, very long period with without any sex, you know, suddenly there's sex again. No, then it suddenly goes off. I don't know how, but I, I feel like I just, I just let myself go, and I let the conversation go. And as I said, that's, th that doesn't always work. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. I didn't know this worked until I read it to you. Do you think it works? Yes. Okay. I, I mean, tell me the truth. <laughs> uh, so this is why I love writing dialogue. For me, it's, it's much more, it's fun, uh, and, it, and it allows me a certain degree of spontaneity that other aspects of writing don't. Um, like if I have to write a descriptive paragraph, I just work on it for just hours, if not days, trying to kind of get it just right, and I feel like I'm sometimes forcing it. But I remember with one of my books, I turned it in to my editor, and the editor said, well, you don't say what anyone looks like. I thought, well, do you have to say what people look like? I guess so. I guess you need to give the reader a visual clue as to what these people look like. But how much do you have to say? And does it have, and how much can you say about eyes? I remember Ann Tyler, the novelist Ann Tyler has a woman who said she had eyes like, like poppy seeds. I thought that was great, yeah. but you, know, you can't use that very often. Um, actually, never. And how many people have eyes that small? Um, so uh, the, those, that's, those are sort of my basic so you, ideas. But, but you see the people when you write? You, are, you, you describe. Do I see them see when I write? Um, not always. Some, some of them, yes. Some of them very vividly. But sometimes I don't. I'm not very visual. Okay. So yeah, if I don't see them, I usually have to like think of someone I know to model the character on because I feel like I need to see them. But no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. I think I think writers are very different yeah, in that way. It's like different parts of the brain yeah. are more, you know, active. But for me, I hear them. You hear them. I hear them more than I see them. Yeah. And have you been writing these characters for a long time, or they're new, relatively new? Well, I've always written dialogue. No, these characters, these, the ones you read now. Oh, oh, God. You, I mean, I've you, been working on this for, like, years, now. it seems to me. I mean, no, these characters are, are n new in that no one has, the book isn't finished, it hasn't been published, so no, I'm the only person in you, <laughs> who, who, who knows them at this point. But you've been listening to them for a long time, I mean. Oh, it seems like, it seems like forever. <laughs> okay. You know, and you get, here's something else, you can, when you're writing a novel, you can start to get really sick of your characters. <laughs> it's like you're, you're stuck at a dinner party, a Leave dinner with them that goes on oh, forever. Yes. <laughs> and you just want to say, you know, please, I want to eat, just be by myself or <laughs> some new people. Although I'll tell you, you know, it's maybe it's because I'm getting older and I'm less patient. But I've actually in this novel, when I get bored, I've been trying to introduce more characters. So I'm trying to actually make that happen. But I tell you, this is really the result. I always say that, and, and this never stops. I, you learn by reading, and I read all the time, and. 
And you know, at this point in my life, there are still writers who are new to me. Well, Muriel Spark, I have read my whole life, but but last year I reread. It was her centenary, mm. so I reread all her books, and it was kind of revelatory to me. And I, I thought, oh my God, she influenced me so much. Mm. But also, her she's so good at dialogue. And then I Become to Burnett is a is a sort of a new discovery. And I read her because I heard that she wrote mostly dialogue, and I was interested in that. She is extraordinarily good at doing conversations with many, many, many people. She has one scene in her novel, Parents with Children, Parents and Children, that is virtuosic. It's a dinner party with 14 people, all talking. <laughs> and it goes on for about 25 pages. And she, and you know, the, what's difficult there is, how do you keep the, the different voices clear in the reader's mind? She does it. It's miraculous. I mean, that's an, that's a feat to, to that many people. Fourteen. Uh, although part of the conversation is that they miscount. They think they're thirteen, which is <laughs> unlucky. <laughs> and apparently, there's a superstition that if there are thirteen people, um, the first person to sit down will will be the first to die. <laughs> so half the chapters, they're all standing up. None of them. Want to sit down. <laughs> it's a very funny scene. She's very. She's very funny. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm amazed. I'm very impressed because you know she's so little known. No, I. I only have one. I don't remember. He has the word servant. In oh, manservant and maidservant. Manservant and maidservant. That's a very dark. Oh yes. But I very it. upsetting novel. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's another thing I'll, I'll just say quickly. Uh, when you are doing dialogue, um, especially if you have more than two people, <gasps> it's really important that the reader not confuse the voices. Um, and to some extent, you can rely on, to use the technical term, dialogue tags. Um, dialogue tags are like, said Miss Bartlett. I was having an argument with a friend of mine about, this is said Miss Bartlett versus Miss Bartlett said. Another writer I know, he doesn't like said Miss Bartlett. He said, he's very difficult. But he said, the only person who the, and I don't know if this is if, if this is even a, an option in Spanish. If there are two ways of doing it. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, she said, the only person who, in his opinion, um, whose name should come after said is God. Said God. Um, otherwise, he wanted. But he's. You know, he was just trying to annoy me. I think. Um, so, dialogue tags. I. You then have the question, do you do anything else besides say and ask? Mm. You know, uh, I think there's sometimes a temptation yeah. to use more descriptive it's verbs. Whispered or Wh say wi warned. Whispered is <laughs> fine. Uh, where, where I get annoyed is when people use yeah. like, sh she lied. <laughs> because I think that's cheating. I think that's using the dialogue tag to tell us it's a lie, and we should know that it's a lie from what is said. And of course, you know, the sort of romance novel vocabulary, which I'm sure exists in English. I mean, one word that I just can't bear is when someone coos. She cooed. Do you know that word? No. Yeah. It's what a bird does. Oh, so it's, it's, a, it's a real sort of romance novel term. Oh, darling, she cooed. <laughs> and so with my students, I'm always, you know, especially my young students, my undergraduates, I have to kind of... So dialogue tags are one way, but... She barked. She barked. Well, if she's a dog? <laughs> I would only use barked for dogs. Um, Better than said. Sorry? Better than said, said the dog. Yeah. Well, said the dog is interesting. Said the dog could be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. What does the dog have to say? Um, a lot, probably. Yeah. My do uh, they say that dogs have a vocabulary of at least yeah. 60 words. Yeah. My dog says a lot. <laughs> I mean, he has different growls, you know. My cat, too. Yeah. My uh, animals actually. I think different. Yeah, I mean, I can tell what he wants from the way. Like, he has different barks yeah. and different. It's interesting. <laughs> of course. Um, okay, so that's one way that you distinguish who's speaking. Um, 
Another way is though, sometimes you don't want all these dialogue tags. Sometimes you want to, uh, like here the repetition of she said, he says, she said, he said is very effective. Yeah. But in more contemporary writing, often you want to just abandon the dialogue tags and just have what the people yes. say. And then the question becomes, you, you don't want the reader to get lost and have to go back counting in yeah, order yeah. to, so then how do you solve that problem? What do you think? There are, there's, there's no doubt of who said what. Yeah. Many times that you can get that. And and there are different ways to do that. What 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 are what do you think are some of the ways you could, you know, make it clear who who is who? You have them address the other character. Right. Also voice. Yeah, they are what they they are who they are. They speak the way they are. Yeah. So you realize who it is. And this is something that as a writer you can. It's actually kind of a, 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 a bit of a trick. I mean, it's sort of a cheap trick, but it, it can work. <laughs> you can give your character a certain verbal tics yes. that will allow you to distinguish them. Like, I have one character in this book who just never uses articles. Uh -huh. Instead of saying, you know, if he, instead of saying the dogs in the yard, he'll just say dogs in yard. <laughs> so because that's his verbal tic, it's always clear when he's speaking. So that's one thing. Uh, the point of view. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the Ivy Compton Burnett example, even though the husband never speaks, that's in some ways tells you his point of view. Yeah. You know, his point of view is silence. Um, the wife's point of view is, is sort of repetition. And this goes on throughout the novel. So if people have very different ideas or opinions mm -hmm. that or different approaches to, to their own lives or, or to each other that is another way that you can clearly distinguish them and that's how in that scene with the 14 characters she does it is that we've gotten to know these people well enough that we know mm. how they disagree and how those disagreements are going to manifest themselves um, what else are there other thoughts of other ways that you can do this I'm, I'm Maybe a uh, character uses some word, yeah. only that character. You know, yes. That's one. Which is true. Like, I have a <laughs> student who always uses the same two adjectives. Yes. <laughs> one is lovely, and the other is this American slang that I didn't even know. Is it dope? Yeah. Yeah. Heard yeah. Dope? Yeah. dope was new to me <laughs> as an yeah. adjective. Yes, the usages of slang, yes. age. Yes. Well, the ages, different ages. Right. Mm -hmm. The uses of slang, and that is, and, and yes. children, I mean, yeah. that Ivy Compton Burnett is great with children, with how children talk. Uh, so there are all these things that are available that will allow you to distinguish the characters. Um, I, I get, what, what surprises me is there are so many writers who, who actually don't go to the, don't do it. I mean, mm -hmm. whose characters all sound exactly alike. Yeah. And it is really yes. impossible to tell them apart. You do have to sort of count up, yes. you know. And the names, you get confused. Maybe there's too uh, many names. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's funny. I have, I have a friend who, who essentially just, she doesn't, she says she's so sick of names. Mm -hmm. She doesn't even want her characters to have names anymore. Mm -hmm. um, because she said she's so tired of, you know, Mary said this and Joe said that. And, mm -hmm. I like names, but mm. names are also tricky. Yes, yeah. You know, yeah. the name has to fit, mm -hmm. and sometimes it, you, it takes a long time to hit the right name. Mm. I don't know why, <laughs> but it does. Like I have this one character who I still I'm now calling her Claudia, but I've changed her name like six times, <laughs> and I'm still not sure. I don't think Claudia is right either. <laughs> First she was Serena, Selena, then she was Lydia. Now she's Claudia. I don't know. <laughs> they don't quite fit. Um, Lydia. Lydia was. Well, first she was Lydia, now she's Claudia. Yeah, so Claudia is better, but I don't think I'm there yet. <laughs> Are you tidy ed ed editing the names? Because don't you have these versions with, with different Claudia? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, no, yeah. yes. <laughs> this is where this is where I use you know the cut and paste, yes. change all. Change all. <laughs> I try to keep it as tidy as I can, but. Yeah, no, it's a messy business. Um, so, 
yeah, so, so I think that, that it's really interesting to write conversations with multiple characters. Um, the, um, the other thing, I'll say two other things and then ask whatever questions you have. Uh, one is, I think we, I tend to favor very naturalistic dialogue, dialogue that sounds to the reader as if it's really being spoken. But I know writers who um, almost very deliberately go the opposite direction, and they have people speak in a very artificial way. And that can also be very effective. Um, I'm thinking particularly of a, of a British writer whose work I love named Rachel Cusk. And I don't know, she's written a trilogy of novels that I'm sure will soon be published in Spanish. I know they'll be published in Spanish. C-U-S-K. Um, but her her dialogue is is very artificial. She, she actually, it's interesting, in her novel outline, the narrator goes to Athens to teach a writing workshop, and all the students are Greek, and she's English, and she's teaching it in English, and they're all writing in Greek. But they all speak good English, so it's sort of like you with me, you know, uh, and and and. Um, they, they, she asks them to each tell a, a, a story about an animal. And they're very, uh, f the, the telling is very formal. It's almost as if it's filtered through her mind. And, and so it's very elegant. But it's very effective, um, surprisingly. It's, it's, it, you wouldn't think so, but it really does work. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was just about the theater. And plays. Uh, I love plays. Are you all? Do you, yes. any of you write plays? Yes. Okay. I wrote one. So I'm interested to ask the playwrights then about this. So when you write dialogue for a play, uh, how, how you have? How do you think about it? It must be because you know, they're actors, of course. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something about that? We have two playwrights, I think. I fully write monologues. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that I have. Something that is actually very difficult to like to make two people talk in theater, and so that action is like still goes on. Do you get me? Uh, so yeah. Sometimes it's and it's actually very difficult. That I like tend to write monologue. That's why I came here. I guess. <laughs> so and you write plays? Yes. Um, I also don't like to put like live play. Uh, some someone is lying because I think it's it's cheating. The actions. Mm -hmm. Yes. I should say. Yes, right? I agree. Not the opinion of the the, the author. Yes, the, the dialogue um, chat basically. Yeah. It's really cheating when for the play. I mean, I've never written a play, and I would love to write a play, but I don't really. I, I think that you have to really understand the world of the theater, which yeah. I don't. I mean, I'm not a person who has much experience in the theater, but my sense is that. When you read a play, it, it loses a lot. You really see, you get so much more when you see it performed. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if, if that's because the writer is sort of conceiving the dialogue to be spoken by actors. Mm -hmm. And that the actors have to bring an important element to it. It's, it's for performance. Yeah, it is very important when you actually, when you write a play, to read it out loud. So reading yeah. it, it's like, well, it's basically the same for this, like how important it is to read the dialogues out loud to hear how it sounds and see if it's, you know, natural or not. Yeah. The other, yeah. I, when you're writing for theater, I think theater is a collaborative process. Right. Mm -hmm. You're never writing the final, when you're writing a story, that's it. Yeah. You've written the final process. The final process takes place in the yeah. reader. but. You've done your work. When you're playwriting, it's the first step right. in what you know yeah. is going to be with the actors, with the director. And your job as the playwright is to really get that ball rolling. Mm -hmm. But you're not the final step. And, and that's, it's a very different yes. mindset. And it'll change. You, oh, yes. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the it better, actors yeah. will bring an ingredient. Yeah, it's in the back yeah. corner. Uh, yeah. And uh, then it'll go to Maybe it will depend on, the, on how you sense the time. The writer in the, in the play yeah. and the, and the writer in fiction. The way that 
also the reader and the people uh, in the play, not the actors, the, the people that go public, let's say, um, sense and feel the time and the conversation, the dialogue that maybe have. I'm glad you mentioned time, time because that's a really important time. element. Yeah. I'll, I'll say something about that. Uh, someone else? Yes? I wanted to say that uh, when you read it, I read it, uh, uh, I, I don't have some, some my English is not so good. Uh, usually the actress, for example, changes in, uh, when, when she acts. And yeah. I think that's very interesting uh, uh, because it leads to humor. I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. Oh, humor, yeah. yeah. Well, just say, you're right. I mean, if you look at, if you see the same play, different productions, yeah. and you see different actors, it's completely, yeah, it's completely different. Yeah. And sometimes they actually will change the lines. But I mean, I'm thinking of like Tennessee Williams, mm -hmm. you know, Blanche Dubois. Mm -hmm. I have always relied on the kindness of strangers. Uh, yeah. If you listen to f do five different actors doing that line, they'll do it in five different ways. You can yes. see it in castings when they cast for yes. a role. It's Only once have I sat in on a casting yeah. session. It was so interesting. Yeah. It was so interesting. Uh, and these, and it, it, I mean, this is a completely, this is not my world, but I find it a very interesting world. Yeah, and also night after night it changes. Because yes. of the interaction between the public and the actors. Yeah. And, and you can have some days people laugh at at parts where other days people are very sad or melancholic or... And that's also true, I was talking with Gabriella about mm -hmm. this, you know, Americans, we have a, our mode at festivals is usually we read aloud, mm -hmm. um, which she was saying is not so common here. Mm -hmm. But last night, Ann Carson and I rebelled <laughs> when we read aloud. But, <laughs> If you're, you can read the same story to different audiences, and some will laugh and others won't. Yes, yes, so, yes, yes. Uh, I just want to say quickly, uh, say something about time and then humor. So time, I'm very glad you mentioned that because I think I, I realize a, a big important aspect of dialogue is that it, it by necessity takes place in real time, mm -hmm. and that is something that that is sort of makes a play mm. often a very different experience. A play, the scene, has to be exactly as long as it takes to perform. Whereas in a novel, you can write five pages in which you cover one minute, or you can write five pages in which you cover a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but with dialogue, you really are in real time. Uh, you know, the, the scene is going to take as long to read as it is to live. And that is something that, so, so in some ways dialogue can slow you down, which is why you have to find techniques for, for moving between scenes, um, or for interspersing the dialogue with, with yes. um, exposition that helps you to move forward in time. Um, one of the simplest and best ways to do that is, is uh, we call in English space break. That just a space, you know, a break uh, between scenes. That's a very, that's like the easiest and simplest way. Um, uh, so time is, you know, something that you need to think about um, because the risk you run when you write a lot of dialogue is that it can start to become slow. Now humor, dialogue offers great opportunities for humor. Absolutely. Um, in fact, it, it can be incredibly funny. And, and uh, that is one way in which I will, I will sometimes write down things that I hear people say yeah. that, I, <laughs> that I want to use. Um, because sometimes people will say things that are, you know, really funny. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes the humor can be that what the person is saying is completely not convincing. <laughs> and that can be funny as well. Um, I think something else that, that is, is challenging is to try to write in dialect. 
mm. which is something else to uh, to think about. I mean, uh, in English, you know, there's a, there there are a lot of dialects. Um, they're not like different languages, but for example, in the South where I live, people speak in a very different way than they do in the North. In Ireland, there's a certain way that people speak that's very different from England. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you how do you convey that? I think that there is sometimes a temptation to use to change the spelling. In other words, like um, a writer who did this all the time was Tom Wolfe. Mm -hmm. So he wants to do a Southern accent. Well, land sakes, ma'am, I think that you know it's a Texas accent. So you instead of writing I, you write A Y. Mm -hmm. You know, I I don't like that. I think that you have to use the words. I, I prefer it just to use the words and the word order. And so often, the, the, the order in which people use words mm. is sufficient to convey a regional accent or a dialect. Um, also, expressions. You know, Steinbeck did that. Steinbeck was great at that. Uh, one that I just learned, which is a South a Georgia expression, is well, I swanee. I'm not even sure what it means. I don't know. I think it means well, I. It's like well, I, well, well, I do declare. I mean, that's what Scarlett O'Hara always says. I do declare. So it's a sort of. Um, but you know, to listen for those regionalisms that can be really interesting and and effective. Um, what do you think about the music? Because you are talking about the sentences and the order. And I think that there is a kind of music when yeah. you, you, you compose this piece of dialogue with different characters. I think you're right. I think there definitely is a, a musical quality. And, and I think it, this is another way in which I think dialogue is a little artificial. Because you don't, like, I will find myself in writing dialogue trying to avoid repeating words too many times. And there's certain words that come up again and again, like think and know. Mm. So when I'm having a conversation, I may say I think 500 times, but I would try to avoid that because I, that particular repetition is jarring to the ear. So, so yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's there's no reason that dialogue can't be beautiful um, uh, and musical um, and uh, sometimes you don't sometimes you you want a more to use a musical terminology you want it to be a little more atonal yes uh, could you please elaborate a little bit about repercussion a repercussion yeah yeah, that's, you know, when she uses that word, repercussion, um, I mean, it's, I'm not 100% sure what she means. Um, repercussion is, is, to repercuss literally is almost like an echo effect. Because percuss, percussion, I think is, 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 is a, a, like a, a drumming sound. You know, we talk about percussion is, but we use repercussion to mean, at least in English, probably this is true in Spanish as well, to mean the, the after effects mm -hmm. of something, yeah. the repercussions of the speech. So I think that, that my hunch is that she's um, thinking more of repercussion in terms of sound. But I'm not sure. That's a, that, it's, a, it's only one word, and I'm not entirely sure how to interpret well, maybe it. The emotions that are triggered by whatever is said yeah. by one character to the other. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Repercussion. Like what happens to the other character when he or she hears that? Yes, yes, and the response, yes. yeah. and how that, or, or or the absence of response. Mm -hmm. um, you know, silence is. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. As we see in that example from Ivy Compton Burnett, the husband not speaking. There's a play uh, by Strindberg um, called, um, I, I can't remember the title, but it's two women. And one. The strongest one. The strongest, one. yes. Uh, one. And one speaks and the other is silent. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing play. Yeah. And I think one is the wife and the other is the mistress of the same man. Is that right? I don't remember. 
something like that. Yes. yes. I saw my sis my sister was in it. When she was, when she was in college, when she was, oh, this is a long time ago. I saw my sister in that play. Did she speak or did she She was the speaker. Like she did all, and she was really annoyed because she had to memorize all the words and the other actor just had to sit there. You know. But that's, it's a, it's a great play. And a really interesting experiment. And it kind of, it, that's monologue, where monologue meets dialogue because the silence is as much as is, is a kind of speaking. Yes? You mentioned that when you write dialogue, you always know what you want with it. I was wondering if that goal is always uh, magic driven, uh, in, in which has the purpose to, to make me go forward, or it has another kind of goal. Well, I think it, it you know, it depends. I'm going to give you a really kind of technical answer. I think it depends where you are in the story or the novel. At the beginning, if you open with dialogue, you're, you're, you're trying to sort of set the scene. Um, and then in the early parts, and I think Ivy Comte Burnett's novels are a great example of this, it's really a, about allowing the reader to get to know the characters through what they say. As you reach, as you moves forward, if it's if it's if the engine is a plot engine, then it increasingly becomes uh, about you know what's happening, where it's moving. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of examples of fiction where nothing really happens; mm -hmm. people just talk. And I'm, I'm I don't want to think of any. I mean. Fiction where nothing happens. Well, Beckett. Waiting for gold. Yeah, Beckett. Uh, Beckett is the classic example, and Beckett's fiction, but it doesn't have a lot of dialogue. But yeah, no, yeah, I mean, he's a genius, you know, and and not yeah, nothing happens, but uh, something sort of happens, yes. you know, uh, in Beckett. But he's probably. Uh, you do example of talking and. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but but what what. In, in, my students tend to fall in love with Beckett, and then they try to write like uh -oh. Beckett, and oh, it's no, we'll it. not <laughs> usually very, very. He's a very hard writer to imitate. Yeah. Have you read? Uh, I'm sorry, Manuel Puig on uh -huh. Yes. Oh, oh, absolutely. He he writes many of his novels are on the. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've read I've read. Um, the Kiss of. I Kiss the Spider, the Spider Woman, and there was another one. Um, the title of which is the is, is with the favorites. Yes. Um, well, the people gave uh, some dialogues are one, one the person <laughs> talking and the other one only, only the, yeah, the dots. The yeah, dots three and, dots. And, and the three dots. That's, yeah, that's a I, have a, I have mixed feelings about the three dots. Generally speaking, but you need to come all the time who's talking. Yeah, I, I, the, it's, it's, it's. I'm never sure what I think about the three dots. <laughs> no, but the three dots are like a way of not, not, not writing right. what the other person is saying. Right. One talks right. and the other people. No, I, I, underst I understand the, the purpose of it. I'm just thinking, is it cheating a little bit? Because you're using punctuation to, to be more than punctuation. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I have mixed feelings about it. I try to avoid that myself. If I have a character not responding, I usually try do? to make that clear like just by in the middle. No, but well, in, in this case it's different because it's not that the other person is not answering. It's that you don't hear the other person answering. Okay. It's, it's different. It's different. So so the character is on the phone, so mm. you have one of the person speaking and the other one is speaking too, but you well, can't listen to, to him. That's, yeah, that's different. Yeah, telephone conversations are that's a whole other yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um Yes. Um, uh, how do you conceive silence and um, I think that Poe is trying to sometimes uh, working with silence and the, from, uh, the formal aspects of um, punctuation. I don't know if you. You know, yeah, silence what? is a very difficult thing mm. to convey. I, frankly, I think the best way to convey it is simply to say he said nothing. Mm -hmm. He was silent. Or no, the case or. Yeah, the, oh, the Compton Burnett. 
Yeah, in that case. Well, but he looked at the window. Yeah, he looked at the window. He he puts the finger in. And that's another thing. Yeah, it's actions. Yeah. Actions in in the place of words. Yes. Do you have any good example of good dialogue in short fiction writing, like short stories? Oh yeah. Um, Well. It's actually very different, I guess. I think that Raymond Carver's stories yeah. have fantastic dialogue, Salinger. and the voices. Salinger, um, another writer who I don't, uh, Amy Hempel. I don't know if yeah. she's. Yeah. 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 Amy Hempel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she writes great dialogue in mm. stories, and her stories have a kind of monologue quality as well. Well, I mean, of course, in a story you don't have as much space, so you have to mm. make more happen with less but um, uh, you know I don't I often give my students an assignment which is to write in a story that's just all dialogue mm -hmm. and it's it's tricky it's I think that I think if you're using dialogue entirely or principally it I, my own feeling is that it's more effective in novels um, you really need to have other ingredients in a story because you have that limited amount of space. But it sort of depends also on how long the story is. I mean, Hemingway stories. Hemingway. Yeah, the Hemingway, yeah. The one those like white the elephants. Kills, white elephants. Yeah. Is the classic example. Yes, yeah, that's have some that's a good one. Yeah. Only dialogue. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering how do you feel about irrelevance in dialogue? Yes. If it's mm. good or sometimes it's contra. I think it it's ineffective. I think it can be very effective, but you can't overdo it. Yes. Because yeah. it, it, you have to be, it, it's sort of like a certain ingredients in cooking. Mm -hmm. You know, just a little bit. Uh, because if you put in too much that's irrelevant, then the reader becomes, you lose the reader's attention. Yes, yes it will bring it down. Yeah. But, Do you have an example when it works? Um, well, I think. In the Forster is a good example. Um, the last line, this meat has surely been used for soup. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, is, is, is sort of off, off, has nothing to do with the conversation, except that it's a complaint. Now, it took yeah, me a long time. You realize that she complains about everything and she's critical about everything. everything. You already know that. And, and because I, was, I didn't really know that, the first time I read this, I didn't know that much about cooking. I wasn't actually sure what she meant. <laughs> and then I realized, I guess, it's, the, it's, it's when you taste, use the meat yes. to make a broth. Yeah, it's, yeah. And then the meat, it's, it's left over, has no taste. So yeah. it, that is an example of it. It, it, it <clears throat> seems irrelevant. It actually isn't. But, um, you know, uh, examples of, of, of irrelevance are... I mean, I, I think it's really the same in fiction as, as, as in our lives. I mean, sometimes people will just say things that have nothing to do with the conversation, but that can be really interesting and revealing. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. of Chekhov. Oh, yes. Chekhov. I'm glad you mentioned Chekhov. And, mm. and, and that irrelevant uh, speeches. Yeah. You think of the plays or the stories? Uh, uh, the plays or the stories? Check off. Um, I was thinking on the play, mm. but the stories too. I don't remember it. The stories of him and I don't yeah. know. I was thinking about the play, but I'm thinking that very hard and, and difficult uh, things are happening between the characters yeah. when they speak. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. And that's true. I think in the stories as well of Chekhov. I mean, I'm thinking in particular of probably my one of my favorite Chekhov stories, which is Enemies, uh, the doctor who whose child has just died, who is summoned to the house of the aristocrat whose whose wife is ill, and it turns out that it's all been a a pretext so she can run off with her lover, and then they have this argument, and there's a lot in that argument that is. They're so not. They're not listening to each other. Mm. So the argument is full of. I guess you could say each is irrelevant to the other. The thing about irrelevance is that, in some ways, it has to be. Sort of, obliquely relevant. I mean, in this example, yeah. the soup. Yeah. You know, it, it seems to be irrelevant, but it actually not, it yeah. tells you a lot. Yeah. So irrelevance is is relative. <laughs> yes, relevance can tell you a lot yeah. about the character. Of yeah, course. yeah. 
I was in a situation last night where I was with two friends who were having a big fight. Oh. It was really <laughs> tense. And one of them wanted to bring me in as a kind of mediator. And the other one did not want to talk about it. And so the three of us were sitting in a bar. And it was so stressful. And I just started saying irrelevant things. Because I just wanted to change the topic. I mean, I sort of wanted to say things like, you know, oh, isn't it a lovely night? <laughs> the weather is beautiful. You know, because I could feel this sort of tension. The weather. The weather. <laughs> you know, oh, I'm so glad to be in Buenos Aires. I can have a pisco sour. You know, so pisco is very hard to find in the United States. <coughs> Drink, drinking helped um, in that case. But that, that, that actually was a scene that I think I'm going to try to use <laughs> or do something with because it was a very interesting weird dynamic uh, to be in the middle of a fight, to have heard both sides of it, to one person who wanted to talk about it and one who didn't. And I just wanted to get me out of here. <laughs> but these were friends of mine here who I don't see very often, so I couldn't. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so I think someone who is, who is really great to read um, for, for maybe, uh, this is a playwright, is Oscar Wilde. Um, yes. I mean, if you read The Importance of Being Earnest, mm -hmm. sort of everything, so much of it is, seems to be irrelevant. Yeah. Um, and so that so much of the humor and is this sort of almost absurdity of the things that people say. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've been thinking about him a lot. Uh, and The Importance of Being Earnest is, is one of those rare plays that is as good when you read it as it is when you see it performed. Yeah, like talking about absurdity, UNESCO. Of course, yeah. of course. Full of. Yeah, yeah. But that relevance is not. It's no. Relevant. Other questions? Well, I hope this has been helpful. <laughs> 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 the, and maybe it gives you an idea of, you know, I don't, I think that there's as much teaching of creative writing here as in the States. It's starting to happen in other countries. A friend of mine in Italy has started a, a creative writing program in Turin. But this is what we do. Yeah. <laughs> this is the sort of, it's shop talk, really. It's shop talk. It's shop talk, right, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, and, and it's funny. In my classes, we tend to talk a lot more shop than we do about the content. Yeah. Uh, because I don't feel it's my job as a teacher to tell my students what to write. I think it's my job to help them to do it well. But I try to stay away from content. Unless I think it's really disastrous. <laughs> well, I can give you an example. The, the only time I ever told a student to stop, to give up a novel, he was trying to write a thriller about someone who, who is deliberately sabotaging um, or stealing stop signs. Uh, stealing stop stop signs. signs. So that people are crossing the street unsafely. And I just said, I don't think this is really going to work as a thriller. <laughs> just, the, the stakes aren't high enough. So this program, how, how long does it take? The, the My program? Yeah. Well, they're all, mine is three years. Oh, okay. It's a three year program. It's a residential program. Our students move and they all teach as well and they get they don't pay they are on They're fellowship on uh, but most MFA programs in creative writing are two years or three years okay. yeah but there are a lot of other ways I mean I know there are like I know that there are classes even uh, Maxine Swan my yeah. friend mm -hmm. here in Buenos Aires said she's teaching a class at Eterna Cadencia yeah. so there are writing classes and there are a lot of opportunities I think they can be really useful especially with a good teacher um, and there are so many great writers in Buenos Aires. I'm sure they're they're good teachers. There is a career here. There's what? There is a career that is licenciatura in arte and escritura. Really? I didn't realize yeah. it was. Yeah. Yeah. So it's here too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Actually, right here in this room. In this uh, workshop. This, uh, oh really? Yeah. Yeah. That's like classes. See, it's been six years since I've been here, so this is all that seems to have happened since I was last here. <laughs> yeah.
Yes, it's new. It's new. It's new. Mm -hmm. I have one more. Yeah. Question. Sure. Um, how do you feel about uh, an indirect speech to a, oh, indirect. As a way to oh, avoid indirect. dialogue? Like sometimes? recorded dialogue. Uh, that's I think it can be very effective. Um, and if, again, I mentioned this writer, Rachel Cusk, yes. she uses it very, very effectively. It can also be a great way to, to move forward at yes. a faster yeah, speed. Faster. Mm -hmm. um, I like reported dialogue, and I like to mix it up with yes. regular dialogue. So it's not all the same. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it can, be, it can work really well. Uh, I think it's, the one thing I would say, I'm, I say this hesitantly because I'm not 100 percent sure. I think it works better when you're writing in first person than in third person, mm. because if you're writing in first person and there's an I narrating, it makes sense that the I would summarize. Yes. Whereas in third person, I I don't think it seems quite as natural. But no, I think it can be very. It's also, I mean, it's it, it it's a kind of a, a a good technique, but it also. Um, has a very different effect because you're hearing what someone says as it's remembered yes. by the person to whom it was said, rather than as it's actually said. So it's 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 a sort of a filtering through the perspective of the narrator. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it.